Hello again, folks, and welcome back. Uh, this time we have Timo, uh, who is the founder and a data engineer at Deep Sky Data. Um, he is going to be teaching us all about making events a first class citizen with activity schema. Uh, he is calling or joining us from Denmark uh, very late, so we really appreciate uh, him making the commitment to come and present for us today. Um, and he's also been an early operational analytics club member for quite a while now, so uh, we're really excited to have him as part of the event. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Timo. Uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end, so continue to add your questions there in the Q&A tab and say hi in chat, and I will see you all in about 24 minutes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, actually, it's uh, 9 p.m. Uh, in the evening already for me, and so what? that's totally fine. We have a really exciting topic, and so uh, I'm not really tired, so uh, I can give you a lot of context. So what I'd like to do today um, is talking about something which is really, how to say, very decent to me, very special to me. These are kind of events. Uh, because, I mean, it's always interesting where people in data are coming from. And so some people really come from, let's say, hardcore data engineering. So they did a lot of data pipeline, really started there, maybe coming from software uh, development initially. And I come from product and come from analytics. And so for me, like tracking events and, and working with events is basically my natural approach to working with data. So um, the other stuff I do too, but like um, usually like where I focus on is uh, I work with events. And, um, and I, f I did this talk because I was struggling to find a really good way how to work with events in, in data models. And so I will present in the end something where I can show you how I do it today and what has changed for me. But before we do that, we need some history, and at least not total history, or at least a little bit of my history. And so especially like where I was coming from when I was doing data modeling. And so I started to create my first data models roughly eight, nine years ago. Um, and so at that time, it was mostly for e-commerce cases. And so um, at that time, I was in Berlin. Berlin was really like super strong on e-commerce. I mean, there was new e-commerce platform out there every week. And of course, like when they reached some kind of growth stage and some kind of evolution, um, they needed at least something that goes beyond the typical tracking, Google Analytics stuff, and so on. And so what we did is like we created the first data warehouse setups at that time, most of them in Redshift, um, for e-commerce. And we did this by the good old star schema, which I guess some people know is already around for, I don't know, 20 years, even longer, I would say. Um, and it worked really well. So because um, in the end, um, e-commerce is pretty straightforward. So you have some important facts uh, or events, which is like often just the transaction uh, that you want to look into. And then um, you can really easily use the star schema to make all the essential e-commerce data visible on dashboards for everyone. And so you can extend the model quite easily, depending a little bit on the case. So it worked really well. And so it started out with Star, which I think a lot of people started out with the Star model. Um, and my product problems basically started uh, some projects later where I was working for a software as a service company. And this company was pretty um, early stage. And so they were still figuring out how their product works best, how their growth funnels will work best. And so what is basically the best combination of different kind of features or maybe of what kind of um, marketing campaign channels to really get the right people in the right shape, activate them, and then in the end get them in some uh, subscription. Of course, like this whole subscription thing we could do also like with uh, Star Schema worked fine. But the usual thing that I do coming from this product perspective is like I want to analyze uh, funnels and cohorts. Uh, I want to see different kind of, let's say, levels of funnels, so high level, sometimes really zooming deeply in, in, in specific kind of areas within the app. And then I want to filter and, and seg segment the different kind of funnels in different ways to figure out, okay, what are basically user groups that are outperforming? What are user groups that are underperforming? So to get an idea where we should focus on, or maybe if we should improve something if the underperforming is too big. 
And to model this was really a pain. And so my explanation why it was so painful is like, and this is very simplified. So I know that there are potentially now data model people out there who maybe um, cringe a little bit. So, but I would say Star Schema works really, really great for classic business reporting, which I mean, we all know as BI, and I mean, BI is still around. And so, and it's also like the, the area where it came from, and like also like the purpose where it came from to really make it possible to create these classic business reports. And what makes a report a business report? I mean, okay, I don't really know if there's an official uh, definition for this, but I would say like business report is like you try to um, show your major KPIs, um, which are often like absolute or relations between these absolute KPIs um, on a dashboard. And this dashboard often has some kind of time series component. So you often show, for example, orders over time, uh, visits over time and anything else. So um, it's... It doesn't really show, so it shows basically the results. So the results of a month, the results of a day, results of a, so it's really very state focused. And it doesn't really show how different things in there relate to each other. So the only relation that you often have there is like some kind of conversion rate. So of course, visits to order conversion rates is maybe like the most famous one, but there might be also like other conversion rates, but that's it. So you don't really do more connections between the things that people happen or that people do in between. And the problem is if you work in product or in gross, um, the essential part where you, where you optimize, of course, you want to look at the results. This is still important. So I don't say that it's not important, so, but it's a different use case. Uh, in the use case for optimizing product and growth, uh, you want to know how people interact with your services, with your products, uh, and anything else over a specific time frame. And so, and there are different things which are important. So what kind of events they are doing? So what kind of features do they use? Then maybe in which kind of order do they do? So which are like the important one when people get onboarded, which are the ones which are maybe showing more that someone is more mature uh, within your application. Then of course you want to know the time in between because especially in software as a service, um, the time in between, it's not an e-commerce shop where you may have, I don't know, three minutes or five minutes. So it can be really across days and this is really interesting to see if you really for example want to um, measure um, activation levels so how good are people understanding your application um, it would be really interesting to see how much time it takes them from level one to level two to level three and um, and also like how often some kind of events are happening because it could be interesting to see that people have to do a specific kind of feature, I don't know, X times until they do the other feature. And so these are all the questions that product people come to you if you do data for them and ask you. And so usually like the answer is like, yeah, maybe you use something like Mixpanel, Amplitude or Posthoc, so classic product analytics tools um, to answer this. And so this is often still the use case, uh, which I use, but I was not really happy because I thought, okay, we have really like the good data in our data warehouse. And so why can't we find a model that makes it easy for us to set it up and especially to change, extend, and maybe switch use cases? Because the good thing is like, if you have your first funnel out and product team get it, they come back with new questions. And it's not such a good answer when you tell them, yeah, well, it takes me six weeks to give you an answer to the new questions. And then again, six weeks. And so... That's not a valid setup. And the good thing is like, there are some also other people who have this kind of problem. And so I came across Ahmed, who's like the founder of, of Narrator. And he is also like the founder or inventor, or at least one of the brains behind Activity Schema. And so he was writing about it, I think on LinkedIn, I saw it, I reached out, we did a call, we did a very long call, a really, really long call. Uh, and, and we looked at it. and. I think I saw for the first time something that looked really promising for me because it's basically an approach to model data and to put events 
uh, in a place that they're really like first class citizens. So it's really about building something around immutable event locks. And I did some data modeling already on ev uh, immutable event locks before. And I really like this kind of approach because it made especially like this kind of product analysis a lot easier than in the other kind of schema. And so I was intrigued. And so I, at some point I, I get, got some time and I did myself a, a sandbox uh, set up to really play around. Of course, like I cannot go to a client and can immediately tell them, hey, I have found this cool new feature or this cool new model on the internet. And I think it's really great. And so we should put uh, your very, very precious budget into it and develop it. So. No, I don't do this. So, um, of course, I start out with myself. And so I, I have a data model for uh, the consultancy we run, for the content we run. And so this was like the best candidate for it. And so we started. But before I share my, my experience with it, I want to give you a quick intro what makes Activity Schema different and special and interesting, especially for the use case that I described. So... Um, I mean, of course, activity schema says they are separating modeling from querying. I mean, the other data models mostly do this as well. Um, so the, I would say even like the more interesting thing is like the single time series table that you create. And so this is quite interesting because in the end, you really want to end up with one table for a business entity. Um, and this is definitely uh, different to all the other models that I work with. And so where you basically explode the number of tables uh, or views that you use. And here we really reduce it, everything to really one table. And it's really like a small table, not like the, I don't know, BigQuery 800 columns table uh, that you potentially can do. Uh, no, it's a really small one. You will see it in a second. Um, and it's all really time series based. So it's in the end, it's just like a, a long, long, long event lock uh, for a specific kind of entity. So speaking about entity. So this was another thing that really intrigued me because um, when I'm building um, tracking schemas or basically data con or event schemas, um, I usually build them around the business entity. So I, I picked like my business entities that I work with or like my clients uh, business entities and then we look into the entities and look what kind of events are relevant for this kind of entity and the cool thing about this kind of approach is like um, you you introduce different kind of let's say stages and hierarchies of events so business um, entities and their action and events are really solid unless you change your business model. So uh, the cool thing is like once this is implemented and it's there, so you can use it for a long time without really make fundamental changes. Um, and I do the same like in product. So product then, for example, a specific product feature for me is an entity. And then all like the actions that someone can do with this product feature, um, I build around this kind of entity. But this this model to really put the entity in the, in the, uh, in the center was really uh, was already something that I was using. And so it was really cool that this here is the same approach. And so to give an idea, so this, for example, is like my, uh, my entity and action model that I use for all the content production that I do. So I have reach, reach is some kind of entity for me because like, at the moment, this is something which is important and, and the, basically the growth phase. And then I have everything around content. And as you can see, like I have different kind. this is basically also like some kind of, let's say content journey. So content gets created and in the end, um, it might get even converted. So right now I don't convert on content, so I don't have a converted action here, but it might be like a future one that, that might come. And so the good thing is like, I developed this 16 months ago, and it really hasn't changed a lot. And so I introduced some more properties, um, which I found and which I thought, okay, could be interesting for me. But this whole thing was pretty static and it hold up. And this is like the foundation. This is the backbone of how I built my activity schema. So because now I basically have one table for content, one table for reach. And this is like the, this is the interesting thing. So you have this single table. And so you, as I said, so let's say I have content, I have one table for the content, and I just have 14 fields. Uh, and every, uh, every table of uh, an activity schema looks like this. So it's always the same. It's always like the kind of same structure that you use, uh, which is at the first 
moment it was a little bit like mm -hmm, okay interesting um not sure if this really works but the nice thing is like when you start to work with it it makes stuff so much easier to do because you you get the schema pretty quickly and you just map everything against it and so maybe just some short notes because uh, this is i think this was the uh, thing where i thought about a lot and i'm still thinking about and this is like so they came up with the idea to say, okay, we give you for each event activity that you put in, we give you these three feature fields. And so in these feature fields, you can provide context. And, and they recommend you to really stay in this kind of schema. And so only if you really have a lot of dimensional data that you need, then to introduce in another dimensional table and to basically link it to it. Because like we want, don't want to do joins. So um, we want, or at least not, left joins, right joins, so we don't want to join uh, a different table. So we either really want to work just within this one table for it. And so what they came up for was a quite interesting concept uh, because I never had thought of it before. It's like they say, okay, you can solve a lot of stuff with feature inheritance. So it might be like when my content is created, I pass on three-dimensional data. So for example, like the ID, um, no, I don't need the ID because the idea would have in the customer. So maybe like the author, uh, the type of content and maybe like the length of words. So be it like this. And then I might have something like content viewed and this content viewed, for example, can have different kind of dimensional data. So maybe for example, like the referrer or like um, campaign parameters. And of course I can combine them by just making inner joints and then basically inherit all the different kind of dimensions from the other events that happened before. And so, so far it works. Um, I still think there are limitations, but you still have the options to go for an additional dimensional table and use this one and just link both together. And so how does it work? I mean, we don't do a full-fledged example, but um, to give you like, um, let's say at least like one use case. And so this is also like from the activity schema documentation. So you find the link here uh, when everything afterwards is shared. So you can just go here uh, and check it yourself. There are also like more examples. Uh, and so this is like, I mean, it's a simple one. So we are looking at a bike business and so you can rent bikes. Um, but, and so here we just look into, okay, how many, um, how many day pass has been purchased? So straightforward use case, a straightforward query. Uh, we just look for the specific kind of activity, purchase day pass. And so we get the, the total number through that. And also like the revenue we generate. Another one is like then a different use case. Okay, we want to know how many people are basically um, subscribed to a yearly pass, which we want to get the people to. So we want to get them first uh, purchase some day pass. And then at some point we want to get them to the yearly pass. And so this is like the baseline. And this is now where, where it comes interesting. Um, and this is like a query where I can find out how often uh, or how many day pass in average, do customers buy before they become a yearly subscription? And now we have a very specific product question, but an essential one. I mean, it's important if you really build around a service. So this is a question you want to get answered. And if you try to do this like with regular models that I worked before, uh, of course it's doable, but it takes you a lot more time and you have to crunch it, you have to join more stuff. And so here it's quite straightforward to do this. Um, and so I don't go into detail. So if you go um, here on this kind of page, so you will see a lot of uh, context there, how everything's working. And um, so, so far I could really do some kind of queries that were quite complicated before. Uh, I could do much easier. And what is my learning so far? I mean, I'm still in the sandbox mode. I'm still playing around. At least now found more people doing the same. So Brad already did a talk yesterday where he was showcasing how they do attribution with that. And so now we are first finding each other who basically doing and experimenting with that and to really exchange stuff. So I think there will a lot more stuff will grow in the next months and more learnings will grow. But my learnings so far. So um, the modeling is super quick and super easy. This is quite cool because you basically, and this is like the, also like the, the third point is like you, the model basically represents your business and you match everything against it. So you don't really care about the source. So for example, for my content model, I pull in like uh, YouTube data, I put in LinkedIn data, I put in podcast data and I put in blog data, but everything goes into the same 
uh, into the same schema. And so I just have to make sure that it fits into that. And that's not so hard. So the queries are really straightforward. And you don't really need DBT and because I mean, I think for the model that I have right now, I run five queries or so. So this is easily set up also like with Prefect or Airflow or even like a different one, CloudBit, whatever you want to use. I often still use DBT because it's just kind of a reflex, but uh, it's not really like the, the, the need for it because the model doesn't become really big. And the other nice thing is like, because I just run five queries, I'm not really in a risk that, I, that my model goes in a state where I create a lot of high cloud costs. And, um, and so this is really nice, especially, in, I mean, I, I worked on, on setups where they had in the end 400 tables and views. And, and it's massive to, to get this. And so here it's nice. So it's really, it's really like, it's the leanest model I ever saw. And so like onboarding also like, it's, it's pretty quick. So if, if you start to, to do a little bit and if you explain it to someone else, I would say in a session, they get it immediately. What is a little bit challenging is like, um, if you get batch data, for example, so I at the moment often eventify it. So if I get data from YouTube, I don't get it as event data. So I basically have to, uh, change batch data into event data. Um, and sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, sometimes I just put the aggregates in the dimensionals, uh, but often I still do it. So if I have 10 video views on a specific day, I basically create then 10 rows uh, of this kind of event, even when it's not really a unique event. I would really love if more platforms go into webhooks uh, because then I can basically get events uh, from everything, but yeah for some platforms is still way to go. I mean, LinkedIn doesn't even have an API. Feature casting and, and doc mania. So, I mean, the, the idea about these three feature things is quite interesting because we really want to avoid really broad tables. We want to have small tables, but of course, like if you have, let's say 10 different kind of activities and you want to reuse all this uh, different thing, for example, in feature one, you can run into the problem that they have different kind of types. So in the end, you end up to do everything as string because string always works, but uh, then you have to make sure that you basically cast it in the right shape when you prepare some reporting tables and you really have to make sure that you document well. So that I then was in the state that I looked at a specific activity and forgot what was in feature two. So yeah, still thinking about this. And I really have to say queries definitely need some rethinking uh, because like it's, it's a different way how you approach the queries and I definitely had to do some rewiring. So is it production ready? Haha, <laughs> I love this question because this is like the killer question that you always get on LinkedIn where a lot of people then say, yeah, no, it's not a question. I think the question is not really relevant because what I do really do is like, I see a lot of stuff which is out there for specific kind of use cases. And um, Star Schema has a specific kind of use case and all the other different data models have their benefits in specific kind of use cases. And Activity Schema for me right now is the best thing for the product analytics part, what I just described, like funnels, cohort, and so on, uh, because it makes it really straightforward and really quick to do. And so for me, it's a use case thing. So you have the data in your data warehouse, so everything comes from your collection layer and all good. And so you can just branch it out as the, let's say, we can even call the data product if we might or should. And then it's just like your, your product analytics thing. And so for that, definitely works. Um, so that's it. I hope I was not too quick in the end, but I wanted to give at least a little bit of time for questions. So, all right. Hello again, Timo. Um, hey. Yeah, we can give folks a couple of minutes to drop some questions in chat. Uh, they were just hyping you up the entire time, uh, so I will let them pivot over to doing that. Um, but uh, I, I, guess, I guess a couple of questions from our side. Uh, how often do you find that you are creating new data models? Um, so it depends on. So um, if I if I come across um, a data model approach or a variant of it, I at least try it out with some kind of sample data to get a feeling. Okay, what are the pros and cons? I mean, this is like the thing with data models. So there is not the best data model in the world. So there's of course like a data model that works really well for some kind of use cases. And so this is this and for activity schema, 
Mm, I don't spend really so much time on now because like the, the, the schema is pretty simple. So um, it doesn't really have to extend it a lot. And so this is also nice. I don't really spend hours on optimizing data models. The only thing that I have to do is if I introduce a new source of data, I have to get it in. And if I have different kind of identifiers, I have to figure out how I stitch identities. I think this is the only work that I do here. Um, and then a question from Brett that just came in. Uh, do you have any visualization you can share from the activity schema? Uh, not at hand. Um, so I could prepare it. Uh, but in the end, like, the, the, so I mean, it depends on if it's just like now a typical um, class model uh, to really see or um, basically relation model, um, then no. So if it was about how I work with visualization uh, on top of activity schema, uh, so I, for example, work with Light Dash, and this works really pretty well. So Light Dash is basically like look-alike, and uh, so look-alike, not look-alike. Um, and so I can define metrics and dimensions directly in in DBT definition, and this works really well with Activity Schema. So especially like the interesting thing is like because it makes it a lot easier to access the data because like a lot of it's really like in the same structure, and this works really nicely. Um, and yeah, if you do have any examples uh, later on uh, after you sleep and when it's a normal time uh, for you, if you want to share them over in OIPO, that would be great too. Yeah. Um, and then a follow-up question from Brett as well. How do you deal with identity resolution? Uh, yeah, good point. Uh, right now, not so much because, like in the in the areas that are tested out, um, I don't really have good identities. So, like I, I showed the use case with with reach and content, and um, in content, it's pretty hard, at least in the beginning of the journey, to really get um, one identity through it. Uh, also, like for the reasons because uh, I'm from Europe and we are very careful with tracking user, and so I built basically a, a setup which is not taking care of users because for me it's important to see how content uh, converts and so i need to make the connection between the content pieces and not about the users itself um it's still something on my desk to really figure out so i have an e-commerce project coming up where we definitely will test it out and their identity will be interesting but yeah brett i would love also to hear your experience there <laughs> i will uh, push that back to brett then or have tag him back in once we're in a way club afterwards too um Awesome. Well, it looks like that is all the Q&A for right now. So aside from that discussion of a question back to the audience, uh, I think that we should be pretty good for today. Um, I will give the same PSA that I have for everybody else. And if you have any other questions for Timo, you can drop all of those in the Operational Analytics Club. Uh, he is there in the track two uh, space uh, for the rest of today and then just generally in the community. So, um, Timo, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for, for coming in and talking with us and kind of sharing your insights. And we will be back in a few minutes.